here by the blessing and the lighting of the Easter camp. So if you'd like to stand and turn and face this way. This normally takes place at the Easter vigil, which we hold on Saturday evening, but we decided not to do that this year. So we're doing this essential part of it, the blessing of the Easter candle. Now, I hope this will provide a taster of what we do on Saturday evening normally um, at Easter time, and perhaps we shall see some of you, if we have an Easter vigil next year, coming along to see the full thing in all its glory. Dear friends in Christ, on this most holy morning, when our Lord Jesus Christ passed from death to life, the Church invites her children throughout the world to come together in a vigilant prayer. This is the Passover of the Lord. We remember his death and resurrection by hearing his word and celebrating his mysteries, confident that we shall share his victory over death and live with him forever in God. First thing I do is to bless the new Easter fire. Eternal God, who made this most holy day to shine with the brightness of your one true light, bless this fire and set us aflame with the fire of your love and bring us to the radiance of your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I mark the ceremony, mark the Easter candle, which identifies it with our Lord. Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, all time belongs to him and all seasons and all ages, to him be glory and power to every age forever. Amen. Amen. By his holy and glorious wounds, Christ our Lord, guide us. And preserve us. And I light the candle from the Easter fire. May the light of Christ, rising in glory, drive out all darkness from each heart and mind. Christ our light. Thanks be to God. Like Mary at the empty tomb, 
we fail to grasp the wonder of your presence. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Like the disciples behind locked doors, we are afraid to be seen as your followers. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Like Thomas in the upper room, we are slow to believe. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we say the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you who take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son, overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him. Grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. Amen. We sit for our first one. Easter anthems usually sung at matins on Easter morning. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and 
says the Lord and the living one. I was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, 
Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the dark of the early morning, coming to pay her last homage to her brutally killed friend, Mary Magdalene was desolate. That grief and trauma were compounded when she found that her friend's body was no longer there. Straight away she ran to Jesus' closest male friends, Peter and the other to whom he was especially close, quite possibly John, the Gospel writer himself. And as men do, they came to investigate. But again, like some men, they didn't really help. John, who believed when he saw the empty grave clothes, kept that belief to himself. And then off they both went back home. No doubt, for good reason, fearing still for their own lives because of their association with Jesus. But leaving Mary distraught and perplexed, not offering her any answers or even the solidarity of their company. But it was then, as she stayed there weeping, that she first saw the angels sitting in the tomb heard them ask that strange question, why are you weeping? And then as she turned around, she saw the stranger who asked her the very same question. And after she'd blurted out her answer, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away, I'll look after him. She hears him speak her name, Mary. And through her tears, she recognises him and utters in wonderment the word teacher and grabs hold of him. So she's the first to hear the risen Jesus explain what has happened. Don't hold on to me because I haven't yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brothers and say to them that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He hadn't simply come back to life, he was entering a new kind of life in the presence of his Father. And as he did so, he was enabling his friends to share that too. And so she goes off to tell the others. She is the first true apostle, the first witness of the risen Lord, the one who stayed by the tomb, weeping long enough to meet him. And not very long after, we find Peter and the other apostles as public figures, boldly proclaiming to both Jews and Gentiles, often in the teeth of opposition, that Jesus was risen from the dead, that God's purposes have come to fulfilment in him. That he is the one whom God has said will judge living and dead, and above all the one through whom people now can discover forgiveness, release from the enslaving bonds of sin's power. We heard one of those early proclamations in our first reading. So despite the fact that Jesus was no longer to be seen except in brief visits for those 40 days, they were convinced not just that Christ was risen, but that his rising changed everything. And that because he was risen, they were risen too. 
But the discovery wasn't easy or obvious. As we heard in the Gospel story, the meaning of the empty tomb wasn't immediately apparent to any of them. Indeed, it would take weeks of patient teaching from the risen Lord for it to start to sink in. And surely the trauma of losing Jesus to such a shocking and painful death didn't disappear overnight. Christ is risen, that is, the faith of the church that we proclaim publicly, week by week. But it's good to be honest with ourselves about the fact that sometimes it's a struggle to believe. Yes, in our heads we acknowledge it, but we find it difficult to look at the world around us, its upheavals and its traumas, its injustices, not to mention our personal stresses and challenges, our guilt and our fear, and still believe that his rising changes everything, that because Christ is risen, we are risen, freed from whatever holds us back from following him in his Father's way. It's hard because we are used to looking for evidence and the fact that we can't see Jesus is a challenge to our normal reliance on what we can see and touch. It's hard because like Mary, like Peter, like John, we've sometimes witnessed trauma that has touched us deeply. We've experienced fear that causes us to turn in on ourselves. It's not easy to stay and see through the tears the reality of a Lord who has been through all of this, who has gone beyond it and promises to take us with him into the presence of his Father. It's hard because like Mary we find it natural to try and hold on to those moments of assurance and vision that we do get, as it were, clinging to his risen body, as she did. But he calls us to believe very often without those props. And although we have may, maybe believed for many years, new threats and challenges to that faith regularly arise. I admit I find it hard to believe that Christ's rising changes everything at times, when tedious chores, oppressing systems or irritating behaviour never seem to diminish. You know we talk about certain things being soul destroying and how sometimes that seems to be literally true. How do we keep our inner selves alive? How do we resist the pressures to conform with those habits that we know Jesus would have shunned that are dehumanising? How do we resist those pressures to compete in battles for recognition and prestige that he dismissed as not worth fighting? Yes, Christ's rising does change everything, the present as well as the future, but how do I hold on to that fact? How do I let it shape my responses to life now? How do I let him change me? And because I find this hard, I'm grateful for this story of the first Easter morning, which shows that the first disciples too found it hard that faith was kindled gradually, in moments, in glimpses, rather than through some sudden overwhelming conviction. For John the beloved disciple, there was something about the strange fact that not only was the tomb empty, but the grave clothes had been left there neatly without the body. Something about that that triggered that moment of belief, even though he 
didn't yet understand all that it could mean. For Mary, I think it was the sound of her name, followed by the flash of recognition. But for all of them, it was a conviction that grew over time as they worked out the implications of believing in a Lord who through his death had put an end to the power of everything that's deathly. You see, their faith wasn't something passive. It wasn't just dependent on feelings and experiences. They knew they had to put it into action in the midst of many doubts and dangers. And it was as they did that that it grew and became strong. That they knew the joy of Jesus' risen presence. And that they saw around them the transforming work of his spirit, God's spirit. So in their common life together, they overcame the barriers between rich and poor as they shared what they have. In their outreach to others, they overcame the division between Jew and Gentile. They discovered that sin's power in themselves and in the structures of their society wasn't as invincible as it had seemed. Despite the tyranny of self-centeredness and the outward tyranny of the empire, they tasted freedom. So if any of us this morning find ourselves struggling to believe that God really has changed everything through bringing Jesus Christ back from the dead, through reversing the verdict that humans have passed on him, I pray that we will see something, one of those teasing, inviting, God-given signs, like the grave clothes without the body, or that we'll hear something like Mary hearing Jesus say her name, something which will kindle that faith afresh, or maybe for the first time. Like those first disciples, we can encourage one another, we can bear witness to one another that he is risen and that we are risen. As we gather, our faith is built and rebuilt. And though we don't see him, the risen Lord stands among us this morning as we break bread together, as he promised. Sadly, for the second year running, we can't, at least most of us can't, sing our usual alleluias. Praise God that we have some people to sing them for us, though. But we can say them. And in doing so, we proclaim to one another again the truth that changes everything and can kindle our faith afresh. And so let's do so once again. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. took our human nature, died for us, and rose again. We believe and trust in you. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in you. This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father.
Jesus is alive. Love has won the victory over sin and death. As we celebrate the risen Christ, let us pray to the God of life in whom we live. We pray for Christians throughout the world who, like us today, are celebrating the joy and hope of Easter. For the Anglican Communion, Justin, our Archbishop, Christopher, our Bishop, and Jonathan, Bishop of Croydon. Trusting in the power of Christ's resurrection, we pray that the Church of God may be bursting with new life, filled with the love that takes even death in its stride, that new and mature Christians together, all in their various ministries, may work in God's strength for the coming kingdom. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Surrounded as we are by the beauty of spring blossom and bulbs, may we be reminded of our part in stewarding Earth's resources, that this beauty may be enjoyed by future generations. We pray that the inhabitants of our planet may recognise God's glory all around, cooperate in the sharing of his gifts, and cultivate the habit of caring love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We give thanks for our families and friends who have shown love and care during the past year rejoicing that our church family is able to be together today. We pray that God will bless our homes and families, our places of work and leisure, with new life and the hope of new possibilities, touching the ordinary with beauty and joy. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracefully hear us. We pray for all those who are not able to be with us in church today and give thanks for the technology which allows them to join us online and for those who have made this possible. We remember those who have asked for our prayers, and especially Tanner Rimner, Margaret Rapp, Robin Sullivan and Jonathan Aiken. We pray for all those who feel trapped or imprisoned, physically, mentally or spiritually. May the stones roll away and new light pour into their lives. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those whom we love but see no longer, the recently departed, Peter Bryce, John Ferguson and Arthur Bass, and for those whose anniversaries fall at this time, Elizabeth Coon, Margaret Simmons, Michael McKenzie, Colin Knuckles, Morris Lishman, Pamela Jordan, Edith Sloan, Peter Holton, Ramnash Sarinkna, Christina Hogg, Marion Hall, Gertrude Bowie, Nora Barnes, James Lemondine, Edith Marie Stifle, Florence Pascal, Cecile Charles. We pray that those who have died to this earthly life may find the fullness of God's eternity flooded with the light of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray that we may live each moment thankfully, assured of God's company and mercy, and in the joy and hope of the resurrection. Merciful Father, Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the risen Christ be always with you. And also with you. Amen. 
Let's offer one another a socially distant sign of peace.
Let us pray. Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen High Priest, and make yourself known in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to be thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Almighty and Eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise and opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so, in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever a hymn of your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless your loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and the blood of your dear son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. <clears throat> Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord of my cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. Lord of all life. Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes, and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with Mary, Mother of God, John the Divine, our patron, and all the saints, to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Rejoicing in God's new creation, we pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Lord, our hearts. 
hunger for you. Give us this bread always. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not for any goodness of your own gives you the right to. Come because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia.
life and for our redemption, gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection had delivered us from the power of our enemy. Grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may live evermore with him in the joy of his risen life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We say together, Praise from God. Made us members of the body of Christ and chosen us as inheritors of your kingdom. We thank you that in this Eucharist you have renewed your promises within us, empower us by your Spirit to witness and to serve, and send us out as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You sit, please, for the notices. Before I ask the church audience to they have any notices, I have to read some bands of marriage. I published the bands of marriage between Samuel Prasad Ruben of this parish and Rachel Elizabeth Vickers of the parish of St Mark Mitchell. If any of you know cause or just impediment why these two persons separately should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it. This is the first time of asking. Please remember Samuel and Rachel in your prayers. Now, Church Wardens, notice us, please. Oh, Debbie is sibling to me, she hasn't got any notices. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can set down to bless the Easter Guard. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To you be glory now and forever. In your great mercy you have given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. By your blessing, may we who have prepared this garden in celebration of his victory be strengthened in faith know the power of his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Risen Lord Jesus, as Mary Magdalene met you in the garden on the morning of your resurrection, so may we meet you today and every day. Speak to us as you spoke to her. Reveal yourself as the living Lord. Renew our hope and kindle our joy. Send us to share the good news with others. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and new hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us to my world. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. God the Father, by whose love Christ was raised from the dead, open to you and believe the gates of everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God the Son, who in burst from the grave has won a glorious victory, give you joy as you share the Easter faith. Amen. God the Holy Spirit, who the risen Lord breathed into his disciples, empower you and fill you with Christ's peace. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, the love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Amen.